behind this song because this song has somewhat of a unique uh, title. The title for this song is called Flame On. And it talks about when Christ comes in a blaze of glory and how only those who are on fire for him will be able to continue to be on fire for him in his presence because the word of God tells us that he's a consuming fire and that consuming fire can burn in us right now through the power of his spirit so think about that as I sing this song This roller coaster ride, and I'm tired of the secret sins I hide. I'm tired of pretending that everything's okay, looking good to all the people. When inside I've lost my way Flame on, flame on Let the fire burn inside Let my heart be a sanctuary For your spirit to abide And when holy fire consumes the earth and when all sin is gone may I remain forever to flame on Lord you have the answer to my heart's desire it's your Holy Spirit's all-consuming fire you will hear me when I'm calling and you will never leave you will keep me from falling if I have faith to believe flame on flame on let the fire burn inside let my heart be a sanctuary for your spirit to abide and when holy fire consumes the earth and when all sin is gone may i remain forever to flame on let the fire burn within consuming all my sin let your holy spirit cleanse and purify all i ask of you is a heart that's tried and true then i'll be caught up to meet you in the sky flame on flame on let the fire burn inside let my heart be a sanctuary for your spirit to abide and when a holy fire consumes the earth and when all sin is gone May I remain forever as your chosen treasure, Lord. You and I together to flame on, flame on, flame on. Let the fire burn in. 
inside let my heart be a sanctuary for your spirit to abide and when a holy fire consumes the earth and when all sin is gone may i remain forever as your chosen treasure yes you and i together to flame oh i will be your treasure we will be together and we'll remain forever to flame We on? Yes, we are. Thank you so much, Neville. Praise the Lord. That's an original song, isn't it? Oh, that is, I've never heard that before. And it fits perfectly with our topic tonight about the fire. Okay, well, all right. Let's open our Bibles to, if you have a Bible, to the book of Matthew, chapter 13. Matthew 13, the title of tonight's meeting is on the screen. And it is called the hot topic of hell. This is, this is a hot topic. It's a controversial topic. It's a subject that is in the Bible and that God wants us to understand. And by his grace and with his help, uh, I hope to share Bible verses that make this subject very clear. So let's bow our heads and let's pray. Let's ask God to help us. Dear God, Father in heaven, what a wonderful group we have again here tonight. Thank you for blessing these meetings night after night. And we pray for the Holy Spirit to please help us as we study the Bible to learn about the fire that is described in your word. Please help me to be faithful to you and to your book. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, are you ready? Here we go, the hot topic of hell. The subject of hell is taught and preached by preachers across the land. Many different ministers in different denominations have different things to say about this subject. Isn't that right? And they don't all agree with each other. You know, some say hell means this. Some say hell means that. There's a whole host of views, and I'm well aware of that. And what I want to do tonight is what I try to do every night. It's not just share my own opinion because I could give you, you know, my view and you could give me your view and we could have all kinds of views. But what we really want to know is what does the book say? What does the Bible say? And so I'm going to do my best to share the word tonight. So let's start with Matthew chapter 13. In Matthew 13, Jesus told a parable, one of many parables, he actually told more than one in this chapter, but there was one particular parable where he talked about a farmer and about a field and about a harvest. And the disciples were very interested in that parable. And if you look at verse 36, Matthew 13, 36, the Bible says, Then Jesus sent the multitude away, and he went into a house. And his disciples came to him, and they said, Explain to us the parable of the tares, or some Bibles say the weeds of the field. And so Jesus answered and he said to them, here's the explanation. He who sows the good seed is who? The son of man, right. He's the good farmer and he's sowing the good seeds, the seeds of truth. And then he said, the field in my story represents the world. The field represents the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. And the weeds or the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is who? The devil. Right. Jesus sows the good seeds and the devil sows the bad seeds. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. And the harvest is what time? 
the end, the end of the world or the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be, Jesus said, at the end of this world. The Son of Man will send out his angels. They will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them who practice lawlessness and will cast them into a furnace of fire. And there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him do what? Let him hear, right. So there is Jesus' explanation of the parable that he told about the farmer, the field, the fire, and the harvest. Now, first of all, my first question to you is, based on what we just read and Jesus' own words, would you say that Jesus Christ believed in a real fire? Yes. Would you say that? Yes. I would. I mean, I'm, I'm with you. I read these words, and it's just Jesus talks about a furnace of fire burning up the weeds, and it seems pretty clear to me that Jesus did believe in a real fire, and I do too. I do too. But now there's something I want you to notice carefully. In verse 40, at least in this parable and the explanation, when does Jesus say the fire takes place? Right, verse 40, he said, so shall it be in the end of this world. Just what verse 40 says, as the weeds are gathered and burn in the fire, so it will be at the end of this world. So based on this text, we know that Jesus did believe in a real fire. And according to verse 40, he put that fire, not something that's burning right now, but it's something that's going to happen in the future, at the end of the world. Now, let's look at another passage. We've got a lot of verses to look up tonight. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Peter also talked about fire. And let's see if it sounds like it's a real fire. And let's also find out when that fire takes place. 2 Peter chapter 3. Verse 7, 3, 7. Peter said, but the heavens and the earth, and when he says the heavens, he's referring to the atmosphere, you know, the sun, the moon, the stars, and the wind, and the smog, and the pollution that we see around us. The heavens and the earth, which are now, are preserved by the same word, the word of God, and they are reserved for what? For fire unto the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. Now, here's another picture of fire. Would you say, based on what Peter wrote in verse 7, does it sound to you like, like Peter believed in a real fire? Sound like it? Sounds like it to me. I believe the same thing. Jesus taught it. Peter said it. But now again, notice, according to this passage, when does this fire take place? Is it now or is it in the future? It's in the future, right. And notice, uh, it's the heavens and the earth which are now, he says, that are going to be, they're reserved or they're preserved until the day of judgment, and that's when the fire will come and the perdition of ungodly men. So this fire is going to actually burn the sky. This fire is going to burn the earth. It's going to burn uh, smog. It's going to burn disease. It's going to burn uh, cemeteries. It's going to burn everything that's evil on this planet, and it's just going to get rid of it, because God wants to get rid of things, and one of the easiest ways to do that is to just cleanse it by fire. And we'll talk more about that as we go along. Now let's keep going. Back up just a couple of uh, pages or verses in chapter, go, go back to chapter 2 of Second Peter, and let's look at verse 9. Chapter 2, verse 9. Peter wrote that the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust, and the King James says, unto the day of judgment to be punished. Now, here's a picture on the screen. Let's just say, and if there's any John Smiths out there, forgive me. <laughs> Nothing personal. But let's just say there was a man named John Smith, and there he is, you know, in his, uh, in his grave, and there's his tombstone there, and it says that he is reserved until the judgment day for punishment. 
Here's the text up on the screen, 2 Peter 2.9. God will reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. So based on this text, when, when does it say that the lost are going to be punished? When do the lost get punished? Are they getting punished now, or is it in the future? It's on the day of judgment, right? And it makes sense that people would first be judged, and then they would be punished. So what we've done so far is we've looked up uh, Matthew chapter 13. We've looked up 2 Peter 3.7. We've looked up 2 Peter 2, verse 9. And when you put these pieces together, and I've got five points here on my notes, which I base right on these uh, scriptures, that number one, there is a real fire. That's pretty clear. Number two, it occurs at the end of the world. Jesus said that plainly. Number three, it occurs on the day of judgment. Number four, the fire that comes on that day will burn heaven and earth. And number five, that is when the lost will be punished. On that day, on the day of judgment, they will finally meet their punishment in the fire. Now, what I just shared with you, these scriptures in Matthew 13, 2 Peter 2, 2 Peter 3, so far, uh, this is actually quite different from what we might call the common view of the fire and the common view of hell. The common view is, and a lot of people teach this sincerely, that when a lost person dies, immediately they go down, down, down somewhere. Who knows exactly how far down they go, but they go down somewhere into a place of burning, and they're burning down there right now. And according to a common view, at least one particular common view, there are millions and possibly billions of lost souls that are down deep, somewhere near the center of the earth, Right now, as we're here above ground, and I'm speaking, they are down below ground, and they are suffering. That's the common view of hell. Now, I want to share something with you that is absolutely shocking, and that is this, that there is only one verse. How many verses did I say? One. Only one. In the entire Bible, and that includes the New Testament, that seems to teach that idea that when a lost soul dies, down he goes, under the ground where, they, where he or she is being tormented in the fire. And that one verse is, the, is in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, which we looked at briefly in our last meeting, but we'll, and we'll look at it more tonight uh, in detail. But it is a shocking fact, but it is true. That's the only place you'll find anywhere in the Bible. It is that concept of a person, of a lost soul dying and going down under the ground, that concept is nowhere in the book of Matthew. You can read the book of Matthew, first book of the New Testament, from chapter 1 to chapter 28, and it's not there. It is nowhere in the book of Mark that a person dies and goes down into the fire. It's just not there. Uh, it's in one place in Luke, the story of the rich man of Lazarus. It's not in the book of John. You can read the whole book of John. You'll never find it. You can read the book of Acts, written by Luke, and it's not there. You can read all the writings of Paul, and Paul wrote most of the New Testament. You can read 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Ephesians, Philippians, Philippians, Colossians, Timothy, Thessalonians, and that idea is totally foreign to anything that Paul has ever written in, the, in all of his writings. Uh, it's not in the book of James. It's not in 1 Peter or 2 Peter. It's not in the book of Jude and it's not in the book of Revelation. Now, don't you think that's pretty shocking? Uh, I think that's a, you know, quite a, an eye-opening uh, truth, but you can read your Bible, and I've been reading my Bible for a long time, and it's, it's just not there. Now, here is something significant. We read our Bibles, at least most of us, I'm assuming here, unless you're, maybe you speak Spanish, you have a Spanish Bible or a different language, but most of us, I'm assuming, are reading English Bibles. The New Testament was not originally written in English. It was written in Greek. And it was then translated into English so that we can read it. I don't, I've studied a little bit of Greek, but I'm not, I'm not a Greek scholar. So I read an English Bible. And when I read my English Bible, I do know that underneath the English words are original Greek words. And there are actually two, there's really three, and the third one I'm not going to talk about because it's only used once and it's not, it's not, uh, the weight of evidence isn't focused on that. But there's two primary 
Greek words that are used for hell in the New Testament. And I'll show you what they are. The first one is Gehenna. Gehenna. And let me show you a text where Gehenna is used. Turn to Matthew chapter 5, the verses on the screen, and let's look at verse 29 and 30. Matthew 5, Gehenna. Have you heard of Gehenna? The word Gehenna means a place of fire, a place of burning, a place that is very, very hot. Matthew chapter 5, let's look at verse 29 and 30. Jesus said, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members should perish than for your whole body to be cast into what? into hell. And the word there for hell is Gehenna. Right. The next verse, he says, if your right hand causes you to sin, cast it, uh, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members should perish than for your whole body to be cast into Gehenna, which is a place of fire, a place of burning. But notice, as Jesus uses that word, he, is not, he does not say that, that the soul leaves the body and goes down into the fire. He's talking about the whole body being thrown into Gehenna, right? So Gehenna is a place of burning, and eventually the whole body of a lost person is going to end up there. So that's important to think about, and all these pieces will come together before we're done. Now, the second word for hell, or at least the word translated hell in our English Bibles, is the word Hades. How many of you have heard of Hades? So it's a rather common word these days. Most people don't most people don't think of Gehenna, but they've heard of Hades. Now, let's look at a verse about Hades. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Hades, or hell, literally means the grave. That's what it means. And that is very easy to prove from 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, one of the letters of Paul, and if you look at verse... Let's see, how much of this do we want to read? Verse uh, 51 describes the mystery of the day when Jesus comes and the dead are raised and we are changed. Verse 52, Paul says it will happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. The trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Verse 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, verse 54 says, when this corruptible, which is what we are now, has put on incorruption, which happens then when Jesus comes, and this mortal, which is what we are now, has put on immortality, which is when Jesus comes, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. He said, Jesus says, or Paul says, death is swallowed up in victory. And then he says, he's actually quoting an Old Testament passage that when, when the saints are coming out of the grave, they are going to be saying, Oh, death, where is your what? Your sting. And in my Bible, in the New King James that I'm reading, it says, Oh, Hades, where is your victory? That's the, the word that's used in the New King James. Now, who is it, again, that's coming out of the graves? Is this the wicked or the righteous? This is the righteous, right, because Paul's saying the mortal becomes immortal, the corruptible becomes incorruptible. This is the great day. Jesus has come down. The trumpet has sounded. This is resurrection morning, and the saints are coming out, and they're so excited. And verse 54 says that death is swallowed up in victory. This is a victorious day. And then it says, O oh death, where is your sting? O oh Hades, where is your victory? Let me ask you, how many of you in your Bible say Hades? Let me Bible say Hades. Okay, any other, other translations besides Hades? Some other Bibles may say, oh, grave? Okay, graves, we've got Hades, we've got grave. Uh, in, any, any others? Death, okay, death. Now, in my, in my Bible, there's a marginal reference to the word Hades, and it also, in some places, at least in the margin, is translated hell because that's the way Hades is often translated. But the translators didn't want to use Hades for hell in this verse because you've got the saints coming out of hell. So they often used it as, uh, as grave. And some of them just left the Greek word there for Hades. And my point is, my point is that this is an easy proof that the word Hades is a reference to the grave 
It's not a reference to a place under the ground where people are burning or souls are burning because how can we even begin to imagine that when Jesus comes that uh, the saved are coming out of a place of burning and saying, Lord, thank you that you finally got me out of this fire. You know, no, obviously not. That, that's not what's happening. So this shows that while Gehenna is a place of fire, the word Hades really means the grave. The saints are simply coming out of their graves on resurrection morning. And that word uh, grave is taken from the original word, which is Hades. Are you following me so far? I know it's a little technical, but you know, if you put the pieces together and think about it, it'll make sense. All right, now let's go on. Let's go to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. And let's look at another reference to the word Hades. And this is actually what happens at the end of the millennium, the end of the thousand years. We talked about this in our last meeting. Revelation chapter 20. If you look at verse 13, 14, and 15. Revelation 20. And we know from the chapter that this is dealing with the end of the thousand years. We know that from verse 7. Verse 7 says, when the thousand years have expired, certain things happen. And verse 13 says, the sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and, now what, it, what does your Bibles translate? Okay, how many of your Bibles say Hades? Okay, how many of your Bibles say grave? Anybody? Okay, how many of your Bibles say hell? Okay, it's, uh, it's about half and half, Hades and hell. And my Bible simply says Hades. Some of your Bibles say hell. And that just shows that, you know, it can be translated Hades or it can be translated hell, right? Either way. And some Bibles in the margin will say next to the word Hades, it'll have a little footnote that will say hell. Now, notice what's happening here. They come, they, it says, the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and then they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. So Hades itself even goes into the fire. This is the second death. If anyone was not found written in the book of life, he was cast into the lake of fire. Now, I want you to notice the order of events. In verse 13, it says that the dead are coming up out of Hades. And again, I'm sticking with my definition here that Hades does not mean a place of burning, that Hades is the grave. God's people come out of Hades when Jesus comes. That's the good resurrection. At the end of the thousand years, there's more people that come out of Hades, and this is the bad resurrection, but they're both coming out of the same place. They're both coming out of their graves. That's my point. Now look at the, the logic of this order. They come out of Hades, which is the grave, and then it says they're judged, right? Each man according to his works. That's what it says in verse 13. Once they come out of Hades, then they're judged, each one according to his works. And then it says in verse 14 and 15 that after this judgment, death and Hades go into the lake of fire. And verse 15 says, so do all the people whose names aren't in the book of life. They're all going into the fire. So what happens is first they come out of Hades, then they're judged, and then they are punished in the fire. Now, does this, does this, does this order make sense? That they come up, then they're judged, and then they're punished. You wouldn't think that people would get punished until after they're judged. First, they have to be judged. That's right. Now, just to try to imagine something here. Imagine a lost person dying today, and that lost person's soul leaves his body, goes down into the ground, is uh, suffering somewhere in the middle of the earth in, in flames. He's suffering in fire. And then at the end of the thousand years, he comes out of the fire, and then he gets judged. What's wrong with that picture? You know, why would God punish somebody in the fire and then bring them out and then judge them? That wouldn't make sense. And it would even make less sense if after God judges them, then he sends them back into the fire. That wouldn't make any sense. Imagine a lost person died a thousand years ago. He was a very wicked person, let's say. A thousand years ago he died, and he goes down into the fire somewhere below the ground, and he's burning. And let's say another person dies today, equal, an equally wicked person. And then he goes down and he joins 
the first person who died a thousand years ago. And they're both down there together. And let's just say, you know, they're, they're there for who knows how long. And they, let's say they meet. <laughs> and they talk to each other, and the one says, you know, how long have you been down here? And the first one says, I've been here for a thousand years. And then he says to the other guy, how long have you been down here? And the second person says, well, I just got here. And so what that, you know, the net result of that would mean that the person who died a thousand years ago had the unfortunate privilege of burning a thousand years longer simply because he died earlier. Does that sound fair to you? It doesn't sound fair. That's right. Yeah, and it, it makes God look like, you know, someone that's just, it's just not fair. I mean, why would he punish people longer simply because they died earlier? That doesn't make sense. This passage makes sense, that all the lost are in their graves. All the saved are in their graves, and they come up at the resurrection when Jesus comes out of the grave. And at the end of the thousand years, those who are lost, they also come up out of their graves, and then they're judged according to their works. And then after that judgment, it says they finally go into the fire in verse 15. Now, go back to verse 13 and take a close look at this. In verse 13, it says at the end of the verse that they were judged. And how were they judged? Each one according to his works. Now, what does that imply to you? That each one is going to be judged according to what he has done. Doesn't that imply to you that God is a just judge and that he's going to judge people fairly based on what they've done? Doesn't that make sense? Now, wouldn't it also make sense that if God is a just judge and if he judges people fairly based upon what they've done, that based on that, that the punishment that comes to each one of them would be proportionate to the crime? Doesn't that make sense? I believe, and I trust that you believe this too, that the God that we serve, the God who is up there, is a good God. Amen. That he's a just God. He, not only is he just, but he's extremely merciful. Amen. He's, uh, he's over, over abundantly merciful. But there are people that continue to reject his mercy. And if they continue to reject his mercy, then eventually they come up at the end of the thousand years, and then they're judged according to what they've done. And then after that, then they get punished according to what they have done. And the punishment is going to fit the crime. Now, doesn't it also make sense that different people are going to get different punishments? I mean, is everybody equally bad? You think uh, Hitler is going to be punished the same as, you know, somebody that's, uh, let's say, you know, in, in their 20s and they just reject the Lord, they don't want God in their life at all, and they're lost. Would that 20-something be punished the same as Hitler? who killed, you know, six million Jews and probably a whole lot of other people. It doesn't make sense. God is a just God. He is a fair God. And one of the purposes, I believe, for the resurrection at the end of the millennium is so that all of the lost can stand before God and realize that God is good, that God is merciful, that God is loving, and that the reason why they're lost is because of their own choices. Their own choices. And the Bible does say that one of these days, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. And I believe that applies to Lucifer as well. Lucifer will one day bow down and confess the justice of his own sentence. And the whole universe will recognize that God is good and that God is just. He's not going to do anything that is unfair or unjust in the slightest. And he's going to make it very clear and very plain exactly what he is doing on the day of judgment. Now, let's go, and we're going to come back to chapter 20, but let's go to Luke chapter 16, and let's look at that story of the rich man and Lazarus. Because like I said, this is the only place in the entire Bible that seems to teach that when a lost person dies, they go down under the ground and begin suffering in fire immediately. It's the only place. So let's take a look at it. It's the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And I'm going to give you tonight seven reasons, and 
consider them, study this yourself, that's what I always expect and hope people will do. I, I, I would like to share with you seven reasons why it seems very clear to me that this is actually a parable, a parable, and that not every detail is meant to be taken literally. So let's take a look at it. It starts in Luke chapter 16, and let's look at verse 19. This is the place, the controversial chapter. Luke 16, 19, the Bible says, Jesus said, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he fared sumptuously every day. And then verse 20 says, there was a certain beggar whose name was Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Verse 22, so it was that when the beggar died, the poor man died, he was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died, and he was buried. And being in torments, and my Bible says in Hades, some Bibles say in hell, he then lifted up his eyes, and he saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus his evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there's a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from where you are, pass over here to us. And then they continue to have uh, some more dialogue, which you can read at your leisure. But anyway, I would like to give you seven reasons, again, why this is a story. This is a parable. And not every detail of it, of it can, should be taken literally. Okay, reason number one is simply, it starts like a parable. And I showed you these verses last night, and these should be in the study guide when you leave. It starts like a parable. In verse 19, Jesus said, there was a certain rich man. In Luke chapter 12, 16, he spoke a parable about a certain rich man. In Luke 13, 6, he spoke also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree. In Luke 16, 1, he told about a certain rich man and told the parable of the unjust steward. In Luke 19, 11, and 12, he told a parable of a certain nobleman. So reason number one is it starts like a parable. In the book of Luke, over and over and over and over again, Jesus begins parables like this, a certain rich man. So to me, that's a, that's a pretty good reason to start out with. Reason number two is the poor man was carried by the angels, and where did he go? It says he, he went into the bosom of Abraham. That's what it says. Now, obviously, we can't take that literally because a person's bosom, you know, is his chest. And that would mean, if you take it literally, that the angels took this man and put him into the chest of Abraham, you know, stuck him in there. And that doesn't make sense. That's, that's not to be taken literally. Reason number two. Reason number three is the rich man is described as being completely in the body. It doesn't say his soul left his body and went down under the ground and was being tormented. It says that he was down there, the rich man went down, the poor man went up, and the rich man, he had a body, he had a tongue, he had eyes, and he looked up with his eyes, and he saw Abraham. And they began to care, have, a, have a conversation back and forth. And then he asks Abraham to send Lazarus back down to dip his finger in water and touch his tongue, because his tongue is being, he's being tormented in this fire. So obviously he has a tongue. Now. Uh, really, can you, take that, can you take that literally? Well, here's, an, here's another reason why you can't. A real person cannot talk in fire. Yes. You can't just, you know, carry on a conversation. If you don't believe me, try an experiment. <laughs> Go into your kitchen sometime and just put your finger on a hot stove for uh, two seconds and see if you can carry on a conversation. <laughs> if you could put your finger there and then say, you know, the stove is really hot, I've got to take my finger off. You, you can't do that. You can't talk when you are, even when your finger is, uh, is, is not even burning, but just on a hot stove, it's impossible. Now, reason number, okay, that's number four here. Number five is the request about cooling his tongue. 
If a person was literally burning in fire down under the ground, the last thing he would do is say, send someone to touch my tongue because I'm being tormented in this fire. I mean, how much comfort would taking a little bit of water and touching the tip of your tongue, what would that do for you? If you were literally burning in fire, how much comfort would that bring to you? It wouldn't bring very much at all. And there's a reason why Jesus said this, and I'm going to tell you this before we're done. But that's reason number five, the request uh, can't be taken literally. Number six, can those in heaven and hell talk to each other? Can we think people down there can look up and talk to people up there and they can just, you know, have a conversation? That doesn't make sense. Uh, reason number seven is that the rest of the Bible, Matthew 13, 2 Peter 3, 2 Peter 2, Revelation 20, and there's many other verses, Malachi 4.1 and other verses that say that punishment occurs at the end of the world after the day of judgment when the fire comes, which makes perfect sense. That's what the rest of the Bible says. Now, if this is just a parable, does that mean that the whole thing just has no lessons for us? Not at all. And there's a lot of lessons for this. We could preach a whole sermon on this, but let me just show you a few other, f other facts. Go back to verse 13. Luke 16, 13. Jesus said, no servant can serve two masters for either he will hate the, the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and, and what else? Money. You can't serve in God and money. Jesus was teaching about this, and he said, you know, some people, they just love money so much, and you can't, you got to serve one or the other. And now notice verse 14. Verse 14 says, now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, they also heard all these things that Jesus was saying, and they... Okay, my Bible says they derided him. Any other translations? They sneered at him, okay? In the margin of my Bible, it says they turned up their noses. Now, if they derided him and sneered at him, what part of their bodies were they using to do that? If they were mocking him, they were using their tongues to do it. So here you've got these rich Pharisees listening to Jesus say you can't serve God and money, and they just laughed and they mocked him. And so then Jesus then tells them a story about a, a rich man who goes down and a poor man who goes up. Now they believe, the Pharisees believe, that the more money you had, the more blessed you were. So if you have a lot of money, if you're wealthy, you're going up for sure, especially if you're a child of Abraham. That's what they thought. And so Jesus then turns things upside down tells about a rich man who goes down, about a poor man who goes up, who goes into the bosom of Abraham, where the rich man thinks he's going, because he's a son of Abraham. And then the rich man looks up and asks Abraham to send Lazarus to touch his tongue with a little bit of water, because he's being tormented in this fire. Now, why did Jesus say that? Who was he talking to? Go back and look at verse 15. Verse 15, right after they mocked him, it says, he said to them. See that? He said to them. And then he continued on, and in verse 19, he told the story. So Jesus was talking to the rich Pharisees. And basically, among other things, there's other lessons here, and you have to really study this chapter to get all those lessons. There's a lot of them there. But one of the lessons is to the Pharisees, who were mocking him with their tongues, that he was telling them, basically, look, fellas, you don't know what you're doing. And if you continue to mock me with your tongues, he says, your, your tongue is going to lead you into the fire. And you're going to be in big trouble. So you need to wake up and listen before you go to that place. That's part of what Jesus was saying. But again, you can't take every detail literally. Now, here's something significant. In Matthew 13, which we already read earlier, Jesus told another parable about fire, a field, a farmer, seeds, and a harvest. And in that particular parable, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, explain it to us. Jesus didn't explain every parable he told. It would have been interesting if the disciples would have come to Jesus and said, Lord, would you please explain the, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus? But they didn't ask him. So he didn't give an explanation. But in this particular case, in Matthew chapter 13, they did. They asked him in verse 36. They said, Lord, explain this to us. And then in verse, uh, we already read in verse 40, Jesus responded and he explained it. 
And he said, as the weeds are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. That's Jesus' explanation of the parable. It's not, he doesn't tell, he doesn't explain the parable with a parable. He gives a parable and then he gives an explanation. And here's the explanation. And so when you put all the explanations together, it's very clear in the Bible that the fire occurs at the end. Now let's go back to Revelation 20 and let's look at some more facts about that fire. Revelation chapter 20, the chapter about the second resurrection and the judgment and the lake of fire, which we looked at in our last meeting. So now we know when the fire takes place, it takes place at the end. Now the next question is where does it take place? We've already read one verse that explains that, but we'll read some more verses. If you look at verse 7, and we looked at this in our last meeting. Most of you were here. If you were not here in the, in the last meeting, you can get the study guide at the end. We have all the guides from all the meetings. Revelation 20, verse 7, tells us what happens at the end of the millennium. Verse 7 says, When the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. And he will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. And we talked about this in our last meeting, that at the end of the millennium, there will be the second resurrection of all the lost. They come up, and the devil goes into them to deceive them. And notice verse 9, it says, they went up on the breadth of the what? of the earth. So where are they? They're on the earth, right? It says also in verse 8 that Satan goes out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. So when they're resurrected at the end of the millennium, they, they come up and they don't go floating up into the sky. They're resurrected and they're on the earth, right? They come out of Hades. They come out of the grave. And before they're judged, Satan goes into them and gathers them and says, hey, look, there's the new Jerusalem. That's the camp of God's people. We can go in there, and we can take that city. And so he gathers all these nations of millions and billions and probably trillions of, of lost souls from Adam's day all the way to the end of time. And Satan gathers them all to march, 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 march. It says they go, on the, they go up on the breadth of the earth, verse 9. They surround the camp of the saints and the beloved city, thinking they can take the new Jerusalem by storm. And then what happens to them? The Bible says in verse 9 that fire comes down from God out of heaven and, what, and does what to them? It says it devours them. Now, now, where does that fire come from? It comes down. Yeah, they don't actually go down to it. The fire comes down on top of them. And they are on top of the earth. So if they're on the earth and the fire comes down on them, the fire is going all over the world. And notice the effects of the fire. We know when it occurs at the end. We know where it occurs now. The people are on the earth. But now what about the effect of this fire? Well, verse 9 says, what does the fire do to them? It devours them. And when you think of devoured, what do you think of? Yeah, how much is left? Did any of you uh, devour your dinner tonight? <laughs> Anybody hungry? <laughs> and devoured your meal. If you devoured your meal, how much of it was left? Uh, my son had a big bag of popcorn tonight. He said, Daddy, he said, if you're going to get any of this popcorn, you better get it now because it's going fast. And I tell you, he devoured it. And then I got some of it and I devoured it. So when it's devoured, it's gone. There's nothing left. So that's, uh, that's one, one text now. But look at verse 10. Some people say, Steve, don't forget verse 10. And I won't. Verse 10 says, the devil, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and they will be tormented day and night for how long? Forever and ever. Now this is, uh, here we have a dilemma to deal with right now. Verse 9 says the fire comes down and devours them and they're, they're gone. All the lost are gone. Verse 10 says that they get tormented tormented day and night forever and ever. So now we need to discuss, we know when it is, it's at the end. We know where it is, it's on the earth. And now the next question is, how long does it go on for? How long does the fire 
last. Verse 9 says they're done. Verse 10 says they're tormented day and night forever and ever. So which one is it? That's what we have to decide. We have to decide which, which one is it. All right, well, uh, let's take a look at some of these issues here. Here's a very interesting issue of U.S. News and World Report. It came out uh, quite a few years ago, March 25, 1991, but it still deals with the issues. And on the front cover, you see the word hell. This was an issue of uh, U.S. News that discussed different views among evangelical Christians about this subject. And inside that, that issue, and I've got that issue, you'll see, you can see this picture here uh, of, of demons under the ground somewhere, you know, and they're tormenting people who go down to hell. And this is, this is sort of a common view. You know, those that, that believe that when you die, if you're lost, you go under the ground and you're in the flames. Some of them, some of them believe that the devil's down there too. And he can stick you, you know, with a pitchfork. Things like that. So here's just a rather gruesome picture showing the common view of what it might be like. Now, the article, the feature article is called, was called Hell's Sober Comeback. And it says three out of five Americans now believe in Hades, but their views on damnation differ sharply. Theologians are struggling to explain these infernal images. Now here is the, one of the key quotes in the article. It says a contentious debate is raging among evangelicals. It's not just among you know, Protestants and Catholics or Jews or Muslims. This is a debate among evangelical Bible-believing Christians. And it says their debate is over the traditional view that the torments of hell are everlasting. People are debating this subject. And let me tell you, one of the reasons for the debate is because verse 9 says they're devoured. And verse 10 says they're tormented day and night forever and ever. So some theologians line up behind verse 9. They're gone. And other theologians line up behind verse 10 and say, no, they're not. They burn forever and ever. So can you see the reason for the debate? Some want verse 9, some want verse 10. So which one is it? Well, let's, uh, let's, let's analyze this. Uh, before I share some interesting pieces of information, let me ask you a question. If, if the options are verse 9 or verse 10, let me just ask you, which one do you like better? <laughs> which option, if you had your choice, would you want it to be? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, you know, I would hope that our, our humanity, our common humanity, would say, well, if we had to make a choice, I sure would rather have people that are lost eventually just be gone so they're not suffering forever and ever and ever, rather than having them be tormented day and night throughout all eternity. I would hope that we would like verse 9 rather than verse 10. But that said... I have to make a very important point, and that is that we cannot base, we cannot base our, our beliefs and our doctrines on what we, what we like better. You know, that's, that's dangerous theology, just to base something because I like this. Uh, we need to base our, our doctrines on the Bible, and not just on one verse or two verses, but on what the whole Bible teaches. And if the whole Bible teaches one thing, and if there's a couple of verses that seem to say something else, it doesn't make sense to make the whole Bible fit into those couple other verses. I'd rather try to look at those couple other verses and try to make sense out of them in the light of the rest of the Bible. To me, that, that makes more sense. Let's look at the majority of what the Bible says. But again, um, we can't base our beliefs on what we want. It has to be on what the Bible says. And, and I want to say this openly and honestly, that if the majority of the Bible teaches this, that they'll be tormented day or night, forever and ever, we may not like that. But if the majority of the Bible says that, then we should believe it, and there's got to be a reason for it. But on the other hand, if the majority of the Bible really says this, then we really should go with that. Right? Okay, now, in that light, let me ask you a significant question. If you look at verse 9, back to verse 9, do you see any symbolism in verse 9? Anything symbolic in the ninth verse? I don't. It's just simply, it's a, it's a narration that the, the lost went up on the breadth of the earth. 
They surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, which was the New Jerusalem. Fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. There is nothing symbolic in verse 9. Now, what about verse 10? Do you see anything symbolic in that verse? Right. It says the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are, and they're tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, the Bible describes the beast in the book of Revelation as having seven heads and ten horns. And he has a body like a leopard, mouth like a, a lion, and feet like a bear. So there is symbolism in verse 10, which there isn't in verse 9. To me, that is something, something to consider. Now, here's another verse in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verse 11. There's a couple of places in Revelation that talk about smoke going up and torment going on forever and ever. It is in the book of Revelation. It's in chapter 20, verse 10. It's also in Revelation 14, verse 11. It talks about those who get the mark of the beast. It says, which we'll talk about on Friday. Next Friday, this Friday, what's tonight? Monday night, this Friday is mark of the beast night. Please don't miss that night. We're going to study this. And verse 11 says, the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, those who worship the beast. The beast. And the beast, again, is a, is a seven-headed, ten-horned creature. So you have a symbol, again, in verse 11, where it also talks about tormented day and night forever and ever. There's another place in Revelation chapter 19. Let's look at chapter 19. It describes this woman... Actually, chapter 17 describes this woman. She's riding a beast. She has a golden cup in her hand. She's all decked out. And she deceives the world. She's riding a seven-headed, ten-horned beast. Her name is Mystery Babylon. She's a harlot. Uh, we will have a meeting later on. Pastor Sean, I think, is going to do a whole Bible study on this woman. This, uh, I call her the Scarlet Harlot. And anyway, in chapter 19, it describes what's finally going to happen to this lady. And if you look at verse 2 and 3, God's people, actually we can start with verse 1. After this I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven, and they said, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord, our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. And again they said, Hallelujah, her smoke rises up for how long? Her smoke rises up forever and ever. Now, here's another one of those forever texts. Just like, you know, tormented day and night forever and ever. There's just a few of these in the book of Revelation, and this is another one. This is another one. But now, if you look at this text carefully, do you see any symbolism in verse 3? It says, her smoke went up forever and ever. And who is her? <coughs> She's the woman that's riding a beast with seven heads and ten horns. Now, this can't, you can't actually believe that there's going to be this, you know, literal woman somewhere that smoke is going to be rising up from her from all eternity. And if you were to ever go look at her sometime, you know, leave the glories of heaven and go over and look at this lady, you'd see this lady writhing in pain. Does that sound logical? No. Again, my point is that... We have another one of those forever verses, but it's connected to symbolism. Every single time in the book of Revelation, when it talks about torment forever, smoke going up from ever, or smoking up forever, these verses are always connected to symbolic language. Always. And I think that is very significant. Now let's, learn, let's go to the book of Malachi, chapter 4, and let's look up some other verses. We've got to do this quickly. Let's look up some other verses. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament that are very straightforward. Very, very straightforward. That do not have symbolism. Malachi chapter 4, verse 1. The Bible says, Behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven. Now notice, it's the, the whole day is going to burn burning as an oven, and all the proud, yes, and all who do wickedly, will be stubble. And that day, which is coming, it's not now yet, it's coming, shall burn them up, 
says Steve Wahlberg. Is that right? Yeah, that's, that's right. I mean, I'm, that's not right. You're right. I'm not right. I'm saying this to make a point. It does not say, saith Steve Wahlberg. It says, saith the Lord of hosts. God says, the day is coming that will burn like an oven. And, it, and concerning the, the proud and those who do wickedly, it says, it will leave them neither root nor branch. Now, let's say I had a plant. Okay, let's use that plant as an illustration. Let's say that was a real plant. And inside its basket there, does it have a basket? Yes, it, was, it had some roots going down. And let's say you took that plant and you burned it up. So there's no roots and there's no branch. How much is left? Nothing. When you burn up the roots and you burn up the branches, there's nothing left. Go down to verse 3. Verse 3, God says to his people, you will trample the wicked, for they shall be, and what will they be? They will be ashes, that's right, under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says who? The says the Lord of hosts. So it's not, you know, something Steve Wahlberg's saying. God is saying this in the Bible, that the wicked are going to eventually end up as ashes. And if they're, if they're ashes, then how much is left of them? There's, there's really... There's not, there's not much. Now turn to Jude 7. Take a look at this. Let's go through these quickly. Jude is right before Revelation. Take a look at this. Jude only has one chapter, and verse 7 is describing what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? The fire came down from heaven and, and burned up those cities. Verse 7 says, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in a similar manner to these. There were other cities, not just Sodom and Gomorrah. There was a few others. It says, they gave themselves over to sexual immorality, which is what a lot of people are doing today. It's a, you know, I could preach a whole sermon on sexual immorality. God wants his people to be... Was, uh. Sorry, I'm in a meeting right now. No. Oh. That was actually my timer telling me that I should be <laughs> winding this up. Sorry about that. <laughs> I didn't think the sound was on, so I'll have to make the best of that. All right, where was I? Uh, yeah, I was talking about sexual immorality. Sexual immorality, God wants his people to be pure. And if you look at Sodom and Gomorrah, you'll see what happened to those that followed sexual immorality. And the Bible tells us, look at it, it says that they went after strange flesh and they are set forth for an example, suffering, and what did they suffer? The vengeance, the Bible says, of eternal fire. Now, some people say, Steve, don't look. Look, the Bible says they're going to suffer eternal fire. Don't you know, Steve, the fire's going to go on forever and ever? That's what people tell me. And sometimes they quote that text to try to prove that I'm wrong. But my response is, take a closer look. Take a closer look. What fell on Sodom and Gomorrah? The Bible says, fire, and they were destroyed as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Are Sodom and Gomorrah burning right now? No, they're not. God sent his eternal, some Bibles say everlasting, which means that it's a fire that they couldn't put out. It came from an eternal God, and it came down and it fell down upon those cities, and when that everlasting fire did its job, then what was left of Sodom and Gomorrah? The Bible says that it was ashes. In fact, I think I've got that text right there. Yeah, there it is. 2 Peter 2, verse 6 <clears throat> says that Sodom and Gomorrah, God turned them into ashes as an example of what would happen to the wicked. See that? So eternal fire that fell on Sodom and Gomorrah turned them into ashes, and that's an example of what's going to happen at the end. See what I mean? So that tells us that the eternal fire doesn't mean it goes on forever. It means it does an eternal job. And when it does its job, it's done. It's done. And those cities are an example of what's going to happen at the end. Make sense? Now, I can't uh, finish without showing you this. What's going to happen to the devil himself? Turn to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28 describes Lucifer. Before he sinned, after he sinned, 
and his ultimate destiny. Ezekiel chapter 28. Verse 14 says, he was the anointed cherub who covers. He was a very high and exalted angel. Verse 15 says, he was perfect in his ways from the day that he was created until iniquity was found in him, until sin was found in him. Verse 16, the middle of the verse says, you sinned. And God says, I cast you out, out of the mountain of God. He kicked Lucifer out of heaven because of his sin. Verse 17 says his heart was lifted up because of his beauty and his pride. Verse 18 says he defiled his sanctuaries by the multitude of his iniquities, by the iniquity of his traffic. And then it says, therefore, God says, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you. I turned you to what? To ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more for how long? Forever. Right, now here's these verses right here on the screen. In verse 18, and it's clearly talking about Lucifer. He was a cherub, he was an angel, he was perfect until he became wicked. This cannot apply to any man. This is uh, Satan himself. And God says in verse 18 that he himself is going to become ashes upon the earth. And then it says, he will be no more forever. Amen. And who says this? Is this Steve Wahlberg or is this the Lord? That's right. The Lord says that Lucifer himself is going to be gone. Someday, Lucifer will be gone. He'll be ashes. He'll be no more. You could look for him if you want to. You could try to find him somewhere. But he's not going to be there. Amen. He's not going to be anywhere. Now, doesn't that sound good? Amen. Wouldn't you? Now, now, think about it. I mean, Lucifer's the worst of them all, isn't he? Yeah. I mean, if the one that's the worst of them all eventually is going to be gone and become ashes and disappear, then that's a pretty strong evidence that God is going to get rid of sin entirely. Amen isn't it? It really is. It's pretty strong evidence. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 20, and let me show you a few more things, and we'll wind this up. And while you're turning there, let me show you another slide. And this is, uh, this is a very important fact. The belief, the belief, don't miss this, the belief that souls will burn forever it's like a branch on a tree that has a root. And the root is the first lie that Satan told Eve in the Garden of Eden. Yes. When he told Eve, if you eat the fruit, you will, God said, you'll die. But the serpent said, no, you won't. You will not die. You will not surely die. Who said that? The devil. The devil. And that was the first lie he ever told the human race. That's the first lie in the Bible. First lie. The belief that souls burn forever is based on the idea that souls don't die. The belief that souls don't die goes back to the serpent in the Garden of Eden who told Eve, you won't die. That's where it comes from. It all goes right back to the devil himself. And, and what did Eve do when she heard that lie? Did she reject it or did she believe it? She bought it. She believed it. Now, some people say to me, Steve, wow, you're just making my head spin. How can all these good people that I know, how can they, even my pastor maybe, how can all these good people be wrong about such an important topic? You ever wondered that? And this is my response. I've thought about that too. How can, all the, how can all these good people be wrong? What about Eve? Was she a good person? Amen. Not only was she a good person, but she was a perfect person. And she was wrong. So perfect people can be wrong. Yes. Uh, and, you know, good people can be wrong. And I'm not saying they're lost because they believe something that's not true. I am saying we need to get back to the Bible and study and find out what the Bible actually says. Amen. 
And if we believe something that's not true and we find out from Scripture, whatever it is, we need to give it up. Whatever it is. And here's a picture of a little, little baby. Who do you think that is? Does that look like me? It's not me. <laughs> I wouldn't show you a picture of me in, in the bathtub when I was a little baby. Anyway, uh, that is, this is my brother, Mike, right here. And this is his, his, uh, his son. This was a few years ago. This little kid's name is uh, Alex. And Alex has grown up, and he's actually a little bit bigger than in this picture. But I want to I illustrate a point. I've been talking, we've been going through a lot of facts, and I've been talking to your heads, tr you know, trying to convince you of reasons that make sense. But I want to talk to your heart before we finish this. Um, we need to pray for my brother. My brother's kind of wrestling with Christianity. He's a doctor in Indiana, and he's not really sure where, he, where he's at. He's very smart. He's a good kid. One year younger than me. But he's not quite settled in on the Bible and Jesus. And I don't think Alex is either. You know, Alex is, I don't know if where he's really at, but I know Alex's dad is not really sure. My brother, Mike, his name is Mike. Please pray for my brother. Uh, anyway, let's just say that little Alex grows up and he gets to be uh, beyond the age of accountability. Let's say he's 14 or 15 years old. And he doesn't believe in, in God, let's say, or Jesus, because he, he loves his dad. My brother's Jewish. I'm Jewish. My brother's wrestling with this now. But let's say when Alex is 15, he thinks to himself, my dad doesn't believe in Jesus, and I, I'm, I'm going to follow my dad. I love my dad. And let's say he's riding his little bike around the neighborhood, and some drunk driver swings over, you know, and, and just hits him and runs over him, and he gets killed. You know, God forbid. Thank the Lord that hasn't happened. Alex is still alive. But let's say it did happen. Wouldn't be impossible for a 15-year-old kid to get killed. You know, bombs are falling on Israel and on Gaza Strip, and kids are getting killed, aren't they? Children. It's awful. And let's say some of these children, you know, that are big enough to know, to be accountable, uh, they don't believe in Jesus. And they die. What's going to happen to these kids? What would happen to Alex? What would happen to all the people that you know? Maybe some of your own loved ones, people that you know that you care about. Let's say they don't believe in Jesus, and if they're lost, what's going to happen to them? Is God going to take them and put them in a place called hell where they're going to burn forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever? And I could just keep going on like this, you know, till midnight. In other words, they'll, they'll never stop burning. Ever. How's that sound to you? And some people might say, what, Steve, don't you know God is just? God is just. And my response to that is, you're right. He is just. And my response is, is that just? Is it just to take a 15-year-old boy who made a, a bad decision that certainly has other factors involved with that decision and then to cause that little boy to suffer for all eternity. Does that sound just to you? Is that really what the Bible says? Is that really what the Bible says? Look at this, the most well-known verse in the whole world. John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever, whoever believes in him should not burn eternally. Is that what it says? No. It says that whoever should believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. See, we have an option. We can perish or we can have eternal life, one or the other. That's what John 3.16 says. The most well-known verse in the Bible. Here's another one. Paul said, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. According to this verse, who gets eternal life? It's those who believe in Jesus. Those who don't believe in Jesus, they don't get eternal life. What do they get? They get death. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says they get death. 
because they've rejected the gift. Here's another thought. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins? Do you believe that he really died? Was he really dead? Did he really rise from the dead? That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. Jesus really was dead, and he really came back to life. And he offers us a gift. It's a gift of salvation. And here's, you know, here's the wonderful thing and the scary thing, that if we reject the gift, then what's left? Ultimately, there's nothing more that God can do. He's tried over and over again, but if we reject the gift, there's nothing more he can do. I'm going to finish with Revelation 20, back to chapter 20 and 21. We'll finish with this. I know I've taken a little bit more time tonight, but how important is this? You know, we, we've got to understand these things. We need to know who we're going to live with forever. We need to know God so we'll want to live with him forever. You know, a lot of people don't, don't want God because of what they've heard about God. So they don't want him. Maybe what they've heard isn't right. You ever thought about that? Maybe what they've heard isn't right. Revelation chapter 20, verse 15 says, actually, well, verse 14 says, death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. The reason it's the second death is because they, they die once, they come up in the second resurrection, and then they die again. They die again. The second death. And that's a, the second death is a death that has no resurrection. There is no resurrection from the second death. And I'll tell you something else. I just, I can't, it's not in my notes, but I can't resist. My, my belief is that the death that Jesus died for us was the second death. But the reason why he was raised was because he never sinned. He died a death we can't imagine, but he came back. Hallelujah. Because he never sinned. When he went down, it was dark. But he came back. Because he loves us. And he wants us to be with him. He wants us to be with him forever. But finally, those that reject him, anyone not found written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. Now, look at the next verse. We just read verse 15. Look at the very next verse. Right after the lake of fire, the scene changes. I saw a new heaven, and I saw a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Now, where were the lost again when the, when the fire came down? They were on the earth. The fire came down, and it, and it became a whole big lake of fire. The whole planet becomes a lake of fire. The lost are in there. Satan's in there. His evil angels are in there. God's people are inside the new Jerusalem, protected from all this. Just like Noah was in the ark, and the whole world was a lake of water, so we'll be inside the new Jerusalem, and the whole world will be a lake of fire. But that lake of fire is going to come to an end because it says in the next verse that then there's a new heaven, and there's a new earth, and the first heaven and the first earth were gone. They are passed away. Hallelujah. Verse 4 says, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there will be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. See that? Look at this. At the end of the millennium, all the lost will be raised. They'll be judged fairly. And because they rejected the gift, they'll be punished fairly. God will send the fire down, burn up the world, burn up sin, burn up the devil, burn up his angels. They'll all be ashes. And then once the fire has completely purified the planet and gotten rid of all sin, so it'll never, be, it'll never happen again, then God will make a new heavens and a new earth. And I believe we're going to get to see him do it. 
because we're going to be right inside the New Jerusalem looking out through the walls, and we're going to watch him make our beautiful world like he did in the Garden of Eden. And then when it's all over, we're going to exit the New Jerusalem onto a planet that is more beautiful than we can possibly imagine. Than we can possibly imagine. And on that planet, there'll be no more death. There'll be no more sin. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more pain. All those things will be gone forever. And I want to tell you, if hell burns forever, then this verse, verse 4, can never happen. There'll always be pain somewhere. There'll always be suffering somewhere. There'll always be crying somewhere. There'll always be pain somewhere. But that's not what the Bible says. God is going to get rid of sin. Totally and completely from his universe. Doesn't that sound good? Doesn't that make sense? Isn't that what the Bible says? The last verse is verse 5. Verse 5 says, and I just love this verse. Verse 5 says, Then he who sat on the throne said, Now this is throne language. It's not from Steve Wahlberg. It's the one who's sitting on the throne of the universe. He said, he said, behold, I make all things new. Hallelujah. And then he said to me, write, for these words are true. And these words are faithful. What you've heard tonight is the truth. Uh, before uh, Neville comes and sings a closing song, I'll tell you one quick story. There was a young man coming to one of my seminars, and his name was Corey. I've had seminars like this for many years. And one time I was holding a meeting, and a man named Corey was coming to the meetings. And he was uh, Jewish. And he, you know, he didn't really believe in Jesus, but he got a flyer in the mail, and he came to the meetings. And when I talked about the, uh, the hell subject, this subject, and he heard the same things you're hearing, he came up to me after that meeting, and he walked up to me, and he grabbed my hand, and he looked at me with almost tears in his eyes, and he said, Steve, Steve, he said, now I can believe. Now I can believe in a God of love. And then he went home. And then the next night, he came back to the next meeting, and I tell you, his face was glowing. This Jewish young man, his face was glowing. And he looked at me, and he said, Steve, he said, last night, I got on my knees, and I accepted Jesus as my Savior. And he said, I'm, he said, praise God, I'm born again. I'm born again. And you know, when that, when that seminar was over, just like we're going to have here Thursday night, we had a baptism. And Corey was in that baptism. And his Jewish mother was there. I still remember that. And she came up to me after the baptism. And she, uh, she looked at me and she said, she shook my hand. And she said, I don't know what's happened to my son. She said, but I can tell you, he looks very happy. That's what she said. Praise God. Navelle, come forward and sing our closing song. God is good. He loves us. He wants the whole universe to understand his true character, his true goodness, what he's all about. And he wants us to understand this subject so we can love him and look forward to being with him forever and ever and ever.
God will dwell with men. There is no need for a temple in the new Jerusalem. I'll make all things new forever my love will reign there will be no more pain in the earth made new now you can stay to rest in my righteousness these words are faithful and true. I'll make all things new. No need for the sun here. I will be your light. And I'll be with you forever. And there'll be no more night. The struggle is now over. No more will I destroy. And because you have been faithful welcome to my joy i'll make all things new forever my love will reign there will be no more pain in the earth made new Now you can stay to rest in my righteousness. These words are faithful and true. I'll make all things, I'll make all things new. I'll make all things new. Forever my love will reign. There will be no more pain in the earth made new. Now you can stay to rest in my righteousness. These words are faithful and true. I'll make all things. Thank you very much. Praise God. Um, before the pastor makes a closing announcement or word, uh, let me tell you again, tomorrow night we're back. Tomorrow night's meeting is called Titanic Truths About the Temple. We're going to study the seven years of tribulation and just kind of deal with these issues. Uh, Thursday night is a mystery subject called The Subject Satan Hates. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I can tell you that the devil doesn't want you to hear it. So I hope you'll be here Thursday night. Uh, Friday night is the Mark of the Beast. That is the biggest night of the entire three weeks where I'm here. It's the hottest subject of all. You'll need probably 10 seat belts for that topic. So uh, bring your Bibles. We'll go through it right from Scripture. And so I hope you'll be here. And then Saturday nights, my last meeting for my wife and I and our kids uh, fly back to North Idaho. Saturday night's meeting is called Armageddon and the Seven Last Plagues. So God is good, and I hope we'll see you. I, I know I've kept you a little bit late tonight, but I hope you feel like it was, it was worth it Amen. and that you're blessed. Amen. Thank you. I want to invite you to stand with me. <clears throat> Did you appreciate the word tonight? Amen. Folks have been coming. Folks have been saying to me, Pastor, I want to be baptized. Amen. Folks 
have been baptized at an early age, and they say, you know, I've come to learn more about Jesus Amen. and the truth in the Bible. Can I be rebaptized? And so we're going to have two baptisms, as we said, one on Thursday, one on Saturday. If you're here today and the Word of God is really making an impact in your life and you like to say, I want to follow Jesus all the way, whether it's uh, being baptized or rebaptized, please talk to me or Steve. Is that all right? Amen. Please talk to us. We'll be happy to work with you on that journey. And then on, on Saturday, we're going to have a concert at 5 p.m. with Nivelle and also with the, with the group Truth. They sang several times here, uh, and they're going to sing again on uh, Thursday. The young man. On Thursday. Yeah, the young yeah, man. Really like so it's going to be an awesome time of testimony and music before Steve speak his final sermon on Saturday. Bow your heads with me as we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for how you are working in our hearts. Thank you so much for the many, many truths that you have taught us thus far. Amen. And we know that they all serve a purpose, that we be drawn closer to you. And we thank you for it. May you seal our decisions for you today, now and for eternity. Go with us now, keep us safe. Bring us back tomorrow. In Jesus' name, let the church of God say. Amen. Blessings to you all.